I'm very nervous, and so when I'm nervous, I like to do the thing that's the scariest thing, already, which is to sing in front of people, because since I'm already nervous, what the hell, right? <laughs> so I'm going to sing this little song. It's, it's an autobiographical song. I didn't write the tune. The tune is to Coal Miner's Daughter, and by the end of it, it's just a verse you'll know um, about me and my background, okay? And then I'll be less nervous, okay? I was born a meat cutter's daughter. My mom is from the Philippines. She was a janitor. I ate TV dinners at night. I grew up by the TV light. While dad drank vodka in the basement and mom hollered. So that's my little song. And I, yeah, I know, kicked ass. But I, I love telling that, saying that part that my mom's from the Philippines because I know people look at me and she doesn't look Filipino. And, um, but I am indeed. My grandma, um, I, I, and one of my topic today is the question that you've all been asking, which is why Americans are so crazy, right? Don't you really want to know? And I'll tell, I, I actually know the answer. Um, so I'm going to be talking about that. Um, uh, and also why I'm not crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I feel like the reason I'm not crazy is it has a lot to do with my grandmother. Um, and when I say my grandma's from the Philippines, um, uh, this is what uh, the, the language I grew up with in my house sounds like. Matigasang ulo ni Linda nakopo. That means hard is the head of Linda. Oh my. Um, and, um, <laughs> and my grandma um, grew up uh, very poor in a rural village in the Philippines. And when she um, came to the States, and she grew up without electricity, um, when she came to the States, um, there was something I noticed right away about her as I was growing up, um, that she was different from other uh, grandmas that I'd seen. One, she was really flexible. She could sit on the floor, she could do all this stuff. The other is, she had really odd ways of telling us how to uh, how to behave. You know, there's grandmas who'd say, now you clean your room, you just get in there and clean your room. This is how my grandma would tell us. She'd go, you know, Linda, there is a vampire named the Aswang from the Philippines. It's a lady vampire. At night, she takes her legs off. She flies over to our house. She climbs the wall, goes over your bed, puts her tongue down to suck your blood because you don't pick up your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and she, having a grandma like that, who had a whole way of um, explaining things that came from a long, long tradition from her village, was really different than a lot of grandmas who, because you know the United States is like 250 years old and kind of acts like a two and a half year old a lot of times. Um, so she helped me. The other thing that helped me was I was devoted to hula dancing. And I, um, I had the kind of family that really didn't care what I did, and no one told me there's no job waiting for you as a hula dancer. So I did a lot of dancing. And then the other thing that I did was I was able to go to school, and I was able to go to college. And it was in, at college that I met my teacher, Marilyn Frasca, who asked me a question that um, changed my life. And it was, I was 19, and she said, what is an image? She asked, what is an image? And her idea was that an image is the thing that's contained in anything that we call the arts or in what kids um, call play or toys. I can t tell you what an image is by telling you what it feels like. If you can remember the very first person that you had a crush on, can you remember? Because I want you to say their initials. I'm going to count to three. I want you to say their initials. Ready? One, two, three. R.S. <laughs> now, the, the third person you had a crush on. Do you feel the difference? Well, you can almost, some of you remember. But can you feel the difference in your head? That first one was spontaneous. So the first thing about an image is it's spontaneous. The other thing is it feels somehow alive. Um, and the way that I can explain that is sort of um, with kids. You always see a kid who has, maybe you were the kind of kid that had a little toy that was like your favorite little toy. Or maybe you know kids who have a little toy that, um, that they know if you go up to them and you say, well, is your bunny alive? And the kid's maybe eight or nine. The bunny knows that he's, the kid knows that, that um, the bunny's not alive in the way we're alive, and so, you know, bunny's not alive. And you say, well, is bunny dead? It's like, never talk about bunny that way. Bunny's not alive, bunny's not dead, bunny's something in between. And what's interesting about that is I always think a bunny is the first artwork. That's the thing that contains an image, and, and kids do it naturally. And I had some friends who had a little girl who got really attached to, I think, the ugliest toy ever made. It was this banana with blue eyes and little dangling arms, you know? It was called Mr. Banana. And, uh, um, she carried Mr. Banana with her all the time. 
time, and her parents were so embarrassed about it, and they went on a trip to London, and um, they were trying to get her off of Mr. Banana, but she wouldn't let go of Mr. Banana, and so they, just, they convinced her to go for a walk with them and leave Mr. Banana by, behind in the hotel. And she wasn't so into that, but they did it. But while they were gone, they came back, and while they were gone, the maids had cleaned the room, and Mr. Banana was gone which I love saying because I like to see faces go, no, not Mr. Banana. <laughs> you even know, don't know Mr. Banana, but you know what I'm talking about. And so she goes crazy. <laughs> She's losing her mind. My friend calls down. Luckily, the concierge understands Mr. Banana. They're in England. Oh, get right on it. And so then they, they do this search, and, he, and she's crying and losing her mind. My friend said the best phone call he ever got in his life was the phone rings, and, it, and it's, Mr. Banana has been found. And so <laughs> run up, knock, knock, knock. They carry Mr. Banana, and this girl is relieved. What, what's interesting about that? This is just a piece of cloth with just some stuffing in it. And it is the difference of whether that girl is going to be able to sleep at night or not. It's, it's a, I always think of it as one of the original wireless devices, you know, um, that it contains an image that she put in there. When you look at kids um, playing, um, they don't go, Barbie, Ken, we're about to play. It's going to be a three act. You first you're going to meet, then there'll be conflict, resolution, and then the denouement. Let's play. No, oftentimes a kid starts playing and they don't even know they're playing. And one of the things that's freaking me out about the digital, or the, the thing about technology is that for the first time in human history, um, the normal amount of eye contact that happened between a child and their parent is now reduced because I look around, moms are always on their iPhones or their Blackberries while kids are doing other things. So the iPhone takes away from the actual like eyes. And so I'm watching this mom, she's having breakfast, her kid's sitting here, he's about eight, and she's having breakfast and she's and he's um, picking up this piece, he's eating his breakfast and he picks up this piece of bacon and all of a sudden he goes, I'm gonna eat you. <laughs> and then he does the bacon going, no, no, so, yes. I'm going to eat you. And I'm watching, like, how's this going to come out? You know, like, I'm really, we're all, like, really into it. And he's like, doing, I'm going to eat you. And all of a sudden, his mom stops just long enough to go, what are you doing? And he has no idea. He had, didn't have any idea that he was playing at all. And so that's another thing is that, that it's spontaneous and it feels kind of alive. And the way I think that we do that as adults is if you've ever had a book that you've carried around and it's been around in your place for a really long time and you haven't read it, it's been years, and finally you say one night you're just going to read it and you start to read it and you realize it's a good book. You know that feeling you get the first 20 pages, it's a good book, 40 pages, it's a little like falling in love, 40 pages, 30, 60 pages, like, don't mess up this relationship, man. And then, um, and then when you're almost done, you have, what do you do? You have 40 pages left. Don't you slow down? You slow down because this world that's so alive to you, that contains an image, um, only has a quarter of an inch left. And, and when you're done, you read the last page. Don't you do this after you're done? Like, look at the book. And like, <laughs> you know, because it's gone from being an object to something that contains an, an image. And another thing about an image is it's specific. Um, I don't know if you know about imaginary friends, but um, I always wanted an imaginary friend and I didn't know how to get one. So um, I decided to just lie, because who could tell? Which meant, <laughs> meant I had an imaginary, imaginary friend. <laughs> which isn't as good as a real imaginary friend. And I had a friend who had a real imaginary friend. And this real, I could tell, first of all, because it had a stupid name, Sprinkles. Secondly, this friend, she could only talk to her through a moving fan. You can't make that up, right? So that, I knew that that was, a, that was a real imaginary friend. Well, one of the things, so you think about all these things with play, and all of us, and one um, day I was hearing on the radio, this, because they can do functional MRIs now, and, uh, uh, and they can do it on little kids, they can do it, and so th there was this um, a neuroscientist who was very interested in what happens in the brain when adults are in the act of creative concentration and kids are in the act of play. And so they did the MRIs and found that their brains looked identical. And what, what was, what was um, striking about it was that, they, um, that the whole brain was activated. When you thought of your first crush, I would say if we had a functional MRI, your whole brain would be activated. If, um, and that third crush where you had to think, it's a smaller part of the brain. So then I started to think, well, what, about, what do we know about play? And one thing everyone can answer, from my little Filipino grandma to my Norwegian grandma, they can all answer this question. If you have a kid and they're never allowed to play until they're 21, what do we know about them by the time they're 21? 
They're crazy, right? They'd be crazy. And um, which is really interesting. And so I thought, well, what about adults? Um, and then I thought, that's why Americans are so crazy. Because we've been completely talked out about it, doing these things, and it happens very early. Um, I remember when I'd be, like, like on the radio, a guy would come on and say, if you'd like, and I'd be 12, if you'd like to be a concert violinist, you must begin by the age of three. And I'd be like, damn. You know? <laughs> or if you, you want to be a ballet dancer, it has to happen by the age of five. It's like, Damn. Um, or you'd always hear writers saying stuff like, I began writing novels very early when I was in the womb with my developing fingers on the fifth sense I wrote my first novel. And you say, well, man, I'm, not a, I'm definitely not a, a, an artist. <laughs> and what, <laughs> so the last thing I want to say is I want to talk about um, phantom limb pain. And I'm going to put this down. Um, and, and about a, a brilliant neuroscientist who you may know, um, V.S. Ramachandran. Genius, and he was particularly interested in the in the phenomenon of phantom limb pain, and um, you all know what that is, right? If you're if you missing your hand, your sensation is that it's still there, and you can feel pain. I believe there's phantom limb pleasure, but no one calls their doctor about it. You know, my missing hand, it feels fantastic. I mean, nobody calls their doctor about that, but it, phantom limb pain. So he had a fellow, he had he had a, a patient who's. Um, Phantom limb pain was his hand was missing, but his sensation was that it was in a fist, and the fist kept getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And this guy was losing his feeling that life was worth living. He lost that feeling. It doesn't seem like much to just have your hand in a fist, but he couldn't sleep, he couldn't concentrate, he didn't want to go on. Nobody knew what to do with him. Ramachandran did this. He built a box, and I always think of it as like a big shoe box. And he put a mirror facing this way, and he uh, put a hole here, and he told the guy to put his hand in so that when he looked down, he saw the reflection of, of a fist. And then he said, open your hand. He opened his hand, he saw the other one open, and the problem was solved. That's what I believe the image world does. I believe that in the course of human life, uh, we have a million things like this, like my grandma who went through the war, or losing a parent early on, or having an alcoholic um, father. Um, I believe there are so many things like this, and the only thing that can open it is an image. And I think that the image world is the doko that carries us, and that it is the corollary to our immune system. It's just like our immune system, except for it's for our mental health. And that these original Digital devices, wireless, biofueled, are the, the key to things, and also these. And that's the thing I would like to say to you, um, that the image world is so much more than art or, um, or something that can bring you something. It actually is like an external organ that has absolutely tied to our mental health, and we ignore it at our peril. Now, I'm just going to do a quick thing. I'm going to end with a party trick really quick. I can sing without moving my lips. It's always good to end with a party trick. No matter how boring this is, this will take care of that. And I mean it from the image part of me to the image part of you. And I'm also kind of a clown. Mm-hmm. <laughs>